First up is Slovenia. So, first of all, I'm going to introduce an amazing writer. Now, for a very small country with a minority language, uh, Slovenia produces some absolutely fantastic wine. Um, and <laughs> it also boasts some really great writers. Um, now, Ewald Flisa is a giant. He's actually quite short, but he is a giant of literature. He's hugely prolific. He's incredibly talented in many different genres, and he's often controversial. So what a great combination. Um, My Father's Dreams, his novel, is published by Istros Books, translated by the author himself and Alan MacDonald Duff. It may shock you, but you'll never forget this book. Welcome, Ewald Flisa. Wonderful. I love that moment when you pretend you haven't met the author before, but um, yes. we have met. <laughs> uh, How nice to see you again. Do I need the... No, you don't. No. no. Uh, That's you just... have said the style, so uh, may I follow? You I've may. come from the right, but this has nothing to do with my political affiliation. <laughs> I don't uh, believe I made a political statement. Uh, as far as I know. As far as you know. <laughs> Now, um, I just want to tell you also that um, we have so many people to thank for all these events, and I'm not going to bore you, but this is terribly important to say, to say thank you to Istros Books and to the Slovenian Embassy for supporting Ewald's trip here as well. Now, Ewald, I was a little bit nervous about meeting you. I mean this generally, because that book has got some tough things in it. Um, I wanted to know what kind of person could write that quite harrowing book, but you're actually really quite nice, so you must be very Mm. different from... um... A very gentle sort of person. Uh, uh, Married happily for the last uh, 10 years with a 30-year-old younger lady uh, with whom I have lived for 20 years. Uh, And we have a lovely son called Martin aged eight. So uh, nothing to do with this book at all. <laughs> so there is a, all of us carry around within ourselves the darker side, you know, mm. the, the shadow, if I return, use the Jung's expression. And uh, <clears throat> what better way to pay our dues to the shadow than to write a book like that occasionally? Mm and frighten people, and, uh, because many people actually start reading and then they say, I can't get on can't with keep, this. Can't keep going. Yeah, it's, it's, too, uh, it's too dark. It's, it's, it's too frightening. Um, but my other books, I'm happy to say, are much, much it's, frightening. Yes, you, d- you, do, you do keep going with it, because it is, you, you want to find out what happens next, and the writing is so spectacularly good that of course you want to keep reading it. But I'm just, wor- I'm just um, worried about you. I mean, how do you cope with that? It's, it's such, I mean, this is everything bad, really. It's abuse, it's, it's, it's parents, children, it's um, adults playing games, it's, um, it's bad sex. It's, there's, no, there's nothing good about anybody in this book. I am not so sure. I think that when the reader finishes the book, he feels somehow cleansed. And uh, because we all carry within us, uh, as I said before, the dark side, Uh, writing for me is a kind of uh, 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 reordering the chaos that, uh, because the world itself is a chaos and uh, Mm -hmm. all the impressions that accumulate within us turn into something really oppressive. And uh, the way to uh, turn this into some kind of order and get rid of at least part of it is to write a book, and then a chapter is closed, and more room is made for the next uh, flood of chaos uh, coming in. Uh, you've, you've, you must have had a lot of chaos in your life, because you've written 15 books. No, uh, 13 novels, 15 13 novels. plays, and uh, two children's books, I'm happy to say. <laughs> And uh, uh, what else? Uh, a book of essays. There you are. A book of essays. And you're, you also edit a, a magazine? or you've... I edit a literary magazine, yes. Uh, founded in 1933. So one of the fourth uh, oldest magazines in Europe. So I have already decided that all the writers, all my colleagues today, all members of your political team, are gradually going to be published in this magazine. You see? <laughs> This is my political manifesto, I'm yes, yeah. <laughs> And you're paying them an enormous sum of money, I hope, for well, uh, contributing to uh, this magazine. 200 euro per piece, yes. <laughs> and it's all government money, because I personally haven't got any. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's great to hear that your government's actually supporting literature. I mean, I'm, I, there is a lot of literature coming out of Slovenia. Uh, yes, well, most, we, of it, um, most of it published by Istros books. <laughs> <laughs> really? I didn't realise that. <laughs> a lot of it. Um, but uh, yes, Istros is a, is, is a wonderful publisher. I'm, uh, but uh, more about it some other time. Um, this is actually the third English publication of this book. Yes. The first one was published in uh, the States, and uh, the second one in India. This is the third. <clears throat> and uh, the original, uh, the American publisher said uh, the original title. Uh, you won't want to hear it. <laughs> Uh, in Slovene, uh, literally translated, was the great beast of solitude. And the American mm -hmm. publisher said, no way. I, I mean, this is <laughs> <laughs> So uh, all translations from uh, uh, to other languages actually uh, follow uh, the, uh, the American It's, the, it's the perfect title because it is about the father and it is about yes. uh, dreams. And it came out before Obama's uh, uh, <laughs> dreams of my father. Yes. <laughs> Before, before we hear from the, from the novel and so on, tell us a little bit about, I mean, you've spent a lot of time abroad as well. I mean, I know you've been very dedicated to Slovenian writing, but you, Slovenian writing but, and, and Slovenia, but um, you've spent a long time in Australia, is that right? A long time Three in the UK? Three and a half years driving underground train in Sydney, yes. Just to make money, to get back to England where I wanted to live, yes, in London, yes. And that was the, the quickest, the most lucrative way of earning money, was uh, driving an underground yes, train? Yes, an underground train driver working Sundays and uh, nights and et cetera, et cetera. I made about uh, slightly more than a surgeon at the Sydney General okay, Hospital. That's me. Yes. Gosh. <laughs> Um, and where did, did you learn, did you speak English before you went to Australia or? Uh, no, I didn't speak any English before I came to England, fortunately. Okay. Because uh, if I'd had English at the grammar school, obviously I would have come here completely mm. tongue-tied, you know. Oh, you mustn't open your mouth because you're not allowed to make any mistakes and so on. No, I came here without any English and I learned it on the street and then I went to study it. Yeah. But this now you're translating, I mean, you've actually, con you've been translating with Alan. Um... Yes, well, uh, <coughs> there's no problem translating. It's a, I have problems with these A's and D's, you know. I mean, th 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 this has to be looked at by a native speaker and then... Uh, these are minor corrections, but very important for me. <laughs> but it is, it is certainly, it's certainly very dense. Now, I mean, what, um, apart from driving an underground train, I mean, you have, to, you have done an awful lot in your life already, and I don't know how you've managed to write all these books, and you've written a radio plays for the BBC, I think, as well. You've been on the... And, and, and morning short stories. And I don't know, stories. do they still do them? Um, we do do short stories, yes. Oh, I wonderful, think we, yes, yes. The BBC still does short mm. stories, yes. Yeah, do, well, I wrote quite a few of them, yes. Yeah. yes no, it's great. So, I mean, I know you've been published in English before, too. How important is it for you to be published in English? Very important, because uh, if I wasn't published in English, then uh, um, <clears throat> how would I be able to be published in Amharic, in Japanese, in Chinese? And I've been published in 36 languages. Um, uh, there are no translators from Slovene in uh, Ethiopia or Taiwan or Indonesia or uh, mm -hmm. in Bengal and so on. So uh, it is absolutely essential for a writer writing in a small language like Slovenian to be translated into English first because uh, English, uh, and I'm sure everybody who is English here will love that, uh, has become the, the language of the world. I mean, anybody who speaks English is okay anywhere in any part of the globe. Let's talk about the book specifically and give a synopsis of this book because um, <clears throat> it, is, it is harrowing, but it is, it is the most extraordinary story and it really sucks you in. Um, I'll give a very short synopsis just to give you a, a bit of a break. Um, the father is called Joseph, the father, it's my father's dreams, um, and he's a very busy village GP. He's very admired, he's authoritarian, he's got a secret cellar um, where he conducts his research. Um, he also enjoys sex in his surgery, um, and he's constantly undermining his wife, who's called Mary, Joseph Mary. Their son is called Adam, um, and Adam, for Adam's um, 14, and he falls in love with a sex-mad, drug-addicted 15-year-old called Eva, Eve. So there is something rather biblical about all this. It is a very moralistic tale. Um, it's very, you know, good and evil. Um, were you writing, I mean, you obviously chose those names deliberately. Or was this by chance? <laughs> <laughs> well, now we have 
finally hit the trouble spot, you see. Asking writers what... Uh, I write intuitively. I never make plans. I, I know somewhere deep inside me what I want to write, but uh, I, I don't rationalize it. Uh, uh, already today, um, I, I never think about uh, the way I write, why I write something, and so on. I just write, and then uh, <clears throat> when the book is finished, I don't want to see it ever again. I don't reread it. Because, you never read your book after it's been published? Uh, no, because uh, if I do, I, uh, I'm instantly tempted to write it again in a different mm -hmm. way. And I have got the time for that, mm -hmm. you see. Um, so, uh, where was I? Yeah. Well, basically, I mean, you're talking about the... I was asking you about the, um, the names, but you've... Um... Uh, yes. Well, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. that. That was pointed out to me afterwards, yes, by the critics. Surely, the Joseph, critics Mary, me. Adam, and... <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Um, I just, uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, mm. uh, the book was written in 2000, that, that's 15 years ago. Yeah. So that's it's, it's interesting, again, it's one of those problems, or well, it's a good thing about translation, at least we get to read it, but um, it, it sometimes there's such a long gap, isn't there? Yes. And here you are brought over to UK to talk about a book that you wrote a very long time ago. Well, but, uh, good books, as they say, I will not carry on, I mean, that's, yeah. that should be enough. <laughs> <laughs> good books always yes. last, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, just very briefly about the dreams. I mean, we never really know um, by the end of the book whether this is a dream or it is reality. Um, and that's obviously deliberate. I mean, is it easy for you to write about dreams? Is it easier than writing about reality? Because Adam, is, is, Adam has is, these really odd dreams. No, but is there a great difference between dreams and reality? I, I can't find any great difference. I mean, it's, the line is so blurred that very often when we dream, we think, uh, I will not mention the famous Chinese philosopher who uh, wasn't sure when he woke up uh, after having dreamed that he was a butterfly, asking himself whether he was a butterfly dreaming that he was a man or a man dreaming that he was a butterfly. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's how it is with me. You see, the, the line between reality... Reality is basically a sort of dream, a kind of uh, interpretation of our memories, which gradually, as we move through life, become interpretations of interpretations of interpretations of memories, which in itself, in the original sense, are not really memories of the events as they happened, but our I mean, we, we make selections, you see, or, or rather the selection is made for us in our minds. So uh, I often think that uh, I had an appendectomy at the age of 12 and uh, was uh, <clears throat> sedated, of course, and I often think that I'm still on that, lying on that uh, operating table and that my life is a dream, basically. Um, and I'm, I'm a completely rational man, but I still, I still often feel that uh, there is a... When, it, when we come to reality, then there is a, is some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, that it's not quite real, you know. Mm. Reality is, is the sort of dream, I Did think. you study psychology? Uh, as well as a few other things, mm. yes. Because yes, that's yes. so clear. But, I mean, the, the, um, the, and you've got this very, um, you've got the psychologist or psychiatrist, Dr. Klein, Kleindienst, or Kleinherr, I forgot. Uh, Kleindienst. Kleindienst, in, absolutely, in the book, yes, uh, yes. It would have to be called that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, what I call that. But, um, but there is a really great um, insight and understanding of the grotesque and the mind and so on too, and I just wonder whether you had either studied it yourself or consulted... Um, I continue to study. I still mm -hmm. study now. I mean, I just, um, uh, I just keep reading, you know. <clears throat> um, I don't study for, for a degree. I never did. But uh, I'm just curious. I, I Great. Really Let's curious. hear some of the, the book. You're going to read um, part my of the book for us? Shall I start at the beginning or the end? You choose. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Not at the end. <laughs> Not at the end. Uh, should I move over there? No. Yes. If you're comfortable yes. there, yes. Yes. Great. So we have um, Ewald Flüsser reading from My Father's Dreams. Can't do without glasses. Uh, nothing to do with age. Uh, I'm a bad reader. Quoting a well-known uh, ancient Greek uh, orator, Demosthenes, uh, yes, I think that's what he said at the beginning of his uh, every speech. He said, I'm a bad bad speaker. I'm a very bad speaker. Well, I'm a very bad reader. So they uh, <clears throat> be prepared for the worst. <clears throat> uh, it isn't easy to talk of one's early life. 
even after so many years. However, allowing for lapses of memory, I intend to hold nothing back. Otherwise, telling the story would be a fruitless exercise. Much of it remains unclear, including why my father, shortly after his 50th birthday, went off his head. That was all the more surprising because he had never given any impression that he was anything other than the sanest person on earth. So at least he appeared to those who knew him. And he was known to a great many people. As a country doctor, he covered 20 villages and was paid regular visits by patients ranging from pregnant girls to old men requiring colostomies. It is true that the doctor in the neighboring district was of a friendlier disposition, but my father could boast a much higher rate of cure. That's why he felt that a guarded measure of disdain for one's patients was hardly a crime. Surprisingly, he was exceptionally pleasant to hypochondriacs, for whom he harbored a special feeling of closeness. In my mother's opinion, he could have been a little less pleasant to young pregnant girls who appeared to be his favorite patients. As far as I remember, that never caused any problems, except once when a particularly attractive gypsy girl from a hamlet in the nearby woods came for an examination insufficiently clean. This upset father so that he locked her into a bathing cabin, releasing her only after she had showered twice and once more for good measure. Although he later denied accusation that he had spent half an hour drying her with a minuscule towel, <laughs> the gypsies threatened him with court action until he mollified them with a wad of cash, about half of his monthly salary. My father was a quiet man, but occasionally he was struck by a fit of anger of such magnitude that he was more shocked by it than anyone else. Usually it was my mother who pushed him over. The border of self-restraint, especially when she dared to criticize his experiments in the basement of the health center. In her opinion, he should have refrained from any work that was not part of his duties at the surgery and devoted the rest of his time, like most husbands, to his family. Family was his usual response. One bastard and one feeble-minded woman are hardly a family. Mother could bear his rudeness only by turning it into a joke. Everybody's got what they deserve, she would observe with a bitter smile whenever she felt disinclined to argue. Her capacity, not to mention the will, to argue with father had eventually waned and they settled for aiming their words past each other, with father exploding only when he was hit accidentally. But never, not even in the throes of his worst distemper, did he hit mother however much I felt that that was what she was trying to get him to do. Whenever I summon my father to memory, I see a tall, slightly stooping gentleman of middle age with slow, careful movements, somewhat plumper around his waist than he would have wished, yet far from being fat. With a neatly trimmed reddish beard and gently graying hair parted on the side, which made him look younger than he was, always wearing a slightly anxious expression, which could, however, together with the softness of his eyes, unexpectedly leap into a warm, puzzling smile, sufficiently charming for him to be known, especially among the female patients, as the handsome doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you.